Psalm 39 is where we find our text today. And just may I say this before we get into the message. This I did not hold this up a while ago, but this is the invitation, the story of Christmas. And it's a very, uh, I think, easy uh, invitation to hand to people, invite them to come. It tells the times of services, child care is provided. And then it gives the gospel presentation very clearly on the back in a very legible way. I'd like to encourage you to get that to people. As you exit today, there'll be numbers of them you can take. You can take 10, 15 of them if you want and get them out to your neighborhoods, your friends, your relatives, uh, work, uh, co-workers, wherever it may be, invite them to come. Many folks will come to a Christmas program and every time they come, they'll get to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you you never know what can happen. Yesterday we were having a meeting and uh, for our workers and the man gave the testimony was such a precious testimony. He came here in 1996 for the first time for a service and quite frankly he didn't like the service. He didn't like it. It was nothing like he was used to and he he left. He lived in Chicago and someone invited him to come came and then he went back and three years later though he was going through a difficult time he was drinking heavily and one Saturday morning a lady came to him and invited him to attend a church he didn't understand everything about the situation but but he said well I'll go she's a nice lady and she he came on his way here he realized I'm going to the same church I went three years ago and it kind of made him angry he goes, I didn't want to go back to that same church but he came and he sat in the auditorium. He said, but everything changed in the middle of that service. In the middle of that service, I realized I was a sinner. I deserved the lake of fire that Jesus loved me. And he was my only hope for eternal life. And I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to go to heaven. And he said, all my, all my premonitions, all my anger, my frustration, it went away when I realized my need was Jesus. And he accepted Christ as his Savior. That was in the year 2000. He has not missed a Sunday in these last 15 years. Been very faithful. And now he brings people on a bus every Sunday from North Chicago. And fills a bus and brings them and goes out and does exactly what was done for him many years ago. And uh, listen to him say that. And he says, you know, I don't, um, I don't, I rarely come and drive my car or drive that bus in, in from Chicago without thinking. Thank the Lord that someone loved me enough to get me to come one time. And I thought about that testimony. I thought that is a wonderful testimony. And may God help us. Psalm 139 is one of 150 psalms in our Bible. The Bible is 66 books in one book. And the first 39 were written before Jesus came. And the last 27 were written after Jesus went back to heaven. But the book of Psalms is the largest book in your Bible. Most anyone, if you're not even familiar with the Bible, if someone told you to find the book of Psalms, you could probably find it by just thumbing through and looking and find it because it's 150 chapters or Psalms. And it's the longest, has the longest chapter in our Bible in that particular book. And there was a song book for the Hebrew people. They would sing these psalms in the Hebrew language, and now they're translated for us in the King James Version of the Bible into English, uh, and we read them and find much strength and help. If you ever go through a difficult time as a child of God, you have probably from time to time thumbed through the book of Psalms and found strength and help for your heart. I have many times. The night that, that my wife and I learned that our 17-year-old son was with the Lord and had passed away in a car accident, I said, I know exactly where I was sitting and what chair I was sitting in in our living room as I read through Psalms 115 and 116 and how it comforted my heart. Psalms 139 is a unique psalm. David was the human instrument that wrote this particular psalm. He wrote many, if not most, of the Psalms. Some were written by Moses, some were written by Solomon, some by Asaph, the choir director of, of the day, and different people through the time had written that. But David, no doubt, wrote many of the Psalms. He is called the Psalmist of Israel. And uh, he learned to write psalms while he was watching sheep with his harp or guitar or a musical instrument. He would sing on the hillside and even was acquired to sing for Saul, the king of Israel. And many of those psalms were put into our Bible. But the one thing about David that we know about David is that he was a man after God's own heart. He was a man who understood God. He understood God's thinking in your heart. It can be summed up in how you think, how you feel, 
and what you desire or what you want. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. David was a man, and by the way, when you read Psalms and when you read the Bible, you ought to, you ought to realize God gave us the scriptures to tell us how God feels about things, how he thinks about things, and what he wants. And by the way, the man or the woman who understands God, it changes your life. See, our view of God, our view of the Lord, and how he thinks and our understanding of God, the Bible says, don't let the, the wise man glory in his knowledge. Don't let the strong man glory in his might or his strength. But if you've got something to glory about, glory in this, that you understand and know God. Because your view of God and my view of God determines my fluidness of life, the fulfillment. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But everything in this society and Satan and even our own selfish desires cast thought, negative thoughts on God. From the first time that Satan opened his big mouth in the Bible, he said this to Eve. Yea, hath God said, do you believe God? And she said, oh yeah, I believe in him. If I don't, shouldn't eat this fruit. He goes, you're not going to die. God doesn't want you to be smart like him. If you eat that, you're going to have all wisdom and all knowledge. God wants to keep you under his thumb. He's messing with you, Eve. And you know what? None of us, I don't think we have the name of Eve today, but we have heard that lie before. God's just messing with you. You can't trust him. Society teaches that, that uh, if you believe in God, you are weak in your mind. You're not a smart person if you believe in God. You have weaknesses. And atheism is growing rapidly. And God does not believe in atheists. <laughs> there are no atheists. You have to become that. You have to climb over so many barriers within your conscience, creation, in, in the calendar, uh, in, in uh, the canon of scriptures, in Jesus Christ to be an atheist. But some people have convinced themselves they are. Someone said there's no atheists in foxholes. Whenever you go through difficult times, even the atheists, it's amazing to me, I've met numbers of atheists, and all of them seem to want to curse God. <laughs> they, they, they say words, they get mad, and they say, Jesus Christ. They get mad, and they say, God, and damn his name. It's amazing to me, here's someone, I don't believe in God. I never heard anyone get mad and say, Buddha, and damn his name. Or Mohammed, and damn his name. They damn people that actually are real, that are true. They damn the true God. But, they don't, but learning to understand, now I don't know that we have very many atheists here this morning. We might have a few that are here. But many Christians can be atheistic in their mind. They can have Jesus as their Savior, but ignore him as who he is. And learning him, it's one of the reasons that we need to study the Bible. It's one of the reasons you need to read your Bible daily. To know yourself, you'll need to know God because you're made in His image. To know God, you'll need to know Jesus because He is the image of God. And to know Jesus, we'll need to spend much time in His Word. In private time this morning before uh, I came to speak here, I apologize to the Lord because I have failed to, to spend an ample time, I think, in just getting to know him and reading his word more. The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. But your opinion of God, what is it today? If you can describe God, if your inner heart could begin to convey your opinion of God, what would it be? What do you know about God? How long would it take you to describe if maybe a 10-year-old child went up and said to you, please explain what you know about God? Would it take 30 seconds, two minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours? How long could you talk about what you know about the mind, the thinking, the feelings, and the desires of God? Dear friend, this ought to be something that should, should challenge us. And here in this 39th Psalm, God tells us things about himself from uh, the human author, David, who said, I want you to know a few things about God this morning. Know about his character and what he, what he knows and what he, what he is like. 
And he begins to say about this because at the time it seems like David is in trouble again. How many of you have been like that? You're in trouble again. You're in trouble. You got another situation that's come and it seems like everywhere you step, trouble just seems to follow you. You're the kind of guy whose horn would go off behind a group of hell's angels on a July summer day. You're the kind of guy that the birds singing outside your window is a vulture, you know. <laughs> It's a rough day. Your mother told you of days like this and you think it's an everyday thing. Well, he was having a difficult time. He had had some struggles. Of what, I don't know. Some scholars think it might have been when Saul was chasing him in the wilderness. Others think it might have been during the time of Absalom's rebellion against him, his own son trying to kill him and take away his kingdom for himself. But he had some difficult times, times of which most of us would not know anything about. Being a fugitive in your own country, being anointed as king and now running like a dog through the wilderness trying to escape someone who is chasing you. Or someone who has a son whose son is hell-bent on trying to kill him and to succeed him as king, bringing a rebellion. But his days were difficult. But he wrote these things about God, and I'd like to just walk through this chapter with you today and this psalm and see things we know about God. Verse number one, would you look at it with me, if you would please, Psalm 139. And before we start, let me just seek the Lord's help. Can we do that, our Father? This morning we want to convey just for a few minutes in public in the next few moments what you've showed me in private. Thank you for these great people. What an honor it is to be with them. On a day when it's kind of nasty outside for temperature-wise and in much more time needed to get to our location today, you've brought this special group of people. Thank you for letting them come, and thank you for giving us a church that uh, we want to exalt Jesus today. We want to learn your truth. I pray you would help us. If there's some without Jesus today, they're not sure if they die to go to heaven, may today be the day that they find that out. I pray for all of us that we'd have a better opinion of who you are and to be able to know the truth, that the truth can make us free from lies and from doubt that oftentimes is put in front of us on a daily basis. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and, mine, and, and uh, mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all of my ways. Would you read verse 4 with me? There is not a my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high that I cannot obtain it. What can I learn about God in that passage of Scripture? Number one is that God knows you. God knows you and he knows me. And he says, here's what I know about you. By the way, we serve a God who is omniscient. He knows everything. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurred to God? Nothing caught him by surprise. He is not confused by IT. I am, but he's not. He's not confused by economics. Wall Street doesn't bother him one bit. Terrorism, terrorism does not terrify God one second. He doesn't lose a, an inkling of sleep. He doesn't slumber or sleep. He knows everything. The God that the Bible teaches about is all-knowing. And David understood that about him. He says, Lord, you know everything. What does he know about you? Well, the Bible tells us. He knows your downfalls. He knows your trials. Many of us walked in here, and we can look into your eyeballs. You can look into mine, but I do not know what's going on behind those eyeballs. I do not know what you've experienced. I don't know what you experience as a 10-year-old child. I don't know what you experience as a 31-year-old man or a 46-year-old young lady a, or a mother or a grandmother or difficulties or challenge. But God knows. He knows the heartaches that you carry. And David said, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, first of all, Lord, I know you know everything and you know my downfalls. You know my hard days. And he also says, I know your uprising. I not only know, God not only knows our trials, but he knows our triumphs. He knows the day you won 
the championship. He knows the day that you got that award. He knows the day you got hired at that job or the day that you got the promotion. He knows the day you got married or when that child was born and you brought that baby home. He knows when you signed for the title at the title company for your home. He knows the blessings that you've experienced. He also knows the downfalls you've experienced. So what does God know? He knows everything. He knows our downfalls, our uprising. Notice, if you would please, look at the next thing he knows. In verse number two, he said, Thou understandest my thought afar off. He not only knows our fa failures and he knows our triumphs, but he knows what we're thinking. He knows my thought afar off. Even the thought that I thought no one knows, he knows. Every one of us have a private world. Our spouse doesn't know about it. Our kids don't know about it. But God knows. There is nothing, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And God knows everything. So what does our God know? He knows our, our faults and our heartaches. He knows our triumphs. He knows our thought afar off. He knows our thoughts. Notice the next thing the Bible says in verse 3. Thou compassest my path and uh, my lying down are acquainted with all my ways. He not only knows our trials, or our triumphs, our thoughts, but he knows your trip. <laughs> he knows your path. He knows what brought you here today. Every one of us came here very, very different pathways. Each of us who got saved and accepted Jesus Christ accepted him under very unique circumstances. Some of us got saved as children. Some as an adult. Some got saved out of a very wicked lifestyle. The, 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 the things we wouldn't want to talk about. Others of us, we were spared that lifestyle. Some of us, we came through broken homes. Some were bus children. Some were people who had good jobs that, that they could have sponsored a bus child to come. But he knows your trip. Some of you are ladies, obviously. Some of you are men. Some of you have, have come different ways. But he says, I, you know the path I've taken. Sometimes you, you want to say to God, you just don't understand what I'm going through. And, and you know what? He does. I don't. You don't understand what I'm going through. I don't understand what you're going through. I don't bear your burdens. I don't know where you came from. I don't know your heartaches. I don't know your trials, your triumphs. I don't know your thoughts, but God knows them. And he knows your path, the trip that you're taking through life. He said, you know exactly what I'm thinking about. I want you to notice this next thing he, he knows here. And he knows our words. Verse number four, for there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, o Lord, thou knowest it all together. In raising nine children, occasionally my wife has talked to me about a child. She goes, do you think it's a problem if, uh, if any of our kids talk to themselves? I said, no, I do it all the time. <laughs> How many talk to yourself sometimes, you know? How many say stuff to yourself that you don't think anybody else ever hears about? The Bible says your words. He says, I know what you're saying. I understand your thoughts. I understand your words. This is a God we serve. He's a God who knows. And then when the psalmist started evaluating, he knows my trials, my triumphs. He knows my thoughts. He knows my trip. He knows my tongue and my words. He says in, in, in almost like an amazement, look what he says in verse number, verse number seven. Excuse me, verse number six. Read it with me out loud together. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. He said, Wow. He said, that's just, that just blows my mind. That's what's too wonderful for me. You could say it in the modern day, it blows my mind. All that God knows. What does God want us to know about him? He wants to know, one, first of all, that he knows. And number two, that he knows you. But number two is that he's with you. I'm so grateful for the presence of God, especially as a child of God. Now, I was speaking this morning in discipleship and speaking with a group of people that are learning the Bible and learning about eternal security. But one of the blessings of being saved is the moment I got saved, the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of me. Now Jesus in bodily form is at the right hand of the Father in heaven if the Bible be true, and that's true. God the Father is in heaven, but I have God's Spirit inside of me. And the Bible says He'll be with me forever. It's one of the guarantees. I know I'm not going to hell. I deserve to go to hell, but I'm never going there. The reason is I have God's spirit in me and he will never leave me nor forsake me. I have him with me. 
And since he's never going to hell, I'm not going to hell because we're inseparable because of his promise. Not because of my feelings, not because of my behavior, but because of his promise. I know that if I died today, I'd go to heaven because I have the Holy Spirit of God inside of me. But I'm glad not only for that, but I'm glad that he's with me throughout life. I can know God knows me and he's with me. Let's look at what the Bible says about that particular topic in verse number seven. Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Or whether shall I flee from thy presence? He said, Lord, can I ever get away from you? He said, where can I go? Where can I go where your spirit is not with me and your presence does not rest upon me? Look at verse number eight. He said, if I send up into heaven, if I go in, into space and in outer space, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, and once again, that particular word does not mean in the Old Testament, when you see the word hell, oftentimes, it doesn't always mean the lake of fire. It can mean that, but in this particular case, it means the grave. Shehol is the, is the word they use there, and it means that if I, if I, if I put into the, into the core of the earth, if I go into outer space, God, you're there. If I, if I go into the core of the earth, he said, you're there too. Look at verse number, verse number uh, nine. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, if I fly off into oblivion or I go into the depths of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall uphold to hold me. For if I say, surely darkness shall cover me, even the, light, the night shall be light unto me. I must hasten here, but let me just say to you, what can we know about God? We can know he knows me. Number two, that he's with me. He, I can't go anywhere that he doesn't go with me. And he's with me to do three things according to the scriptures. Number one, he's there to lead me. The Bible tells us in a passage of scripture you're probably more familiar with than most, Psalm, 9, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He make me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He leadeth me beside. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you know why he is with you today? He's with you so he can lead you. You have never been to tomorrow yet. You do not know what's going to happen today. You don't know the, the difficulties, the challenges you're going to face, and you need someone with you. I always like being someplace that, with someone who already knows what to do. Chicago, Illinois is a wonderful place to visit, unless you've never been there before, and you're by yourself. If I'm going to go to Chicago, I want to go with someone like Daryl Amani, or Terry Hederman, or somebody, my brother-in-law, John Francis, he knows a lot about Chicago. I get turned around so quick in Chicago, I'm about ready to jump in the Green River. It's like I can't find, I don't know which way's which. But to go with someone who knows all about it, but my friend, Brother Jerry Vargo, he is a, he's a historian and he, he grew up in this area. And so he's learned about John Hancock and John D. Rockefeller and all the things that, that happened there. If I were to go to Chicago, I want to go with someplace who's al someone who's already been there. You know, God's already been there. He's with you so he can lead you. He's with you so he can hold you. When you have someone that the Bible says two are better than one. Because if one fall down, the other one will pick him up. And you know, I'm glad that wherever I go, and I've fallen down a lot. I've, I've tripped a lot in life. I've messed up. I found myself on my ear, but I'm glad I'm never by myself. He's there to lead me, to hold me, and then to enlighten me. When darkness covers and there will be some difficult days, I'm glad that I have his presence. Things I know about God, number one, he knows me. Number two, he's with me. Number three, I want you to notice here, if you would please, at the top of page number, or the, at, the, at verse number 13, the Bible says, for thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee. Verse 14, read it with me and read it out loud to yourself. Would you please? Verse 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I would like everybody to read it one more time. Let's read that together. Young people, read this. Teenage girl, read this. Single mom, read this. Elderly adult, read this. And think about it. Ready? Once again. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth quite well. Society wants to make us think that we don't have what we need right now to be presently happy. You're not pretty enough. You're not rich enough. 
Can you, re will you retire right now if you wanted to? What if you lost your job? Would you be able to continue on? A lot of times, fear in the media try to get us to wonder what's going to happen or can we, be, can we trust God? Can we trust what's going to happen to us? But the Bible says here that not only did God know, does God know us and is He with us, but that He made us. And you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He be, this is a wonderful passage of, of, of Scripture for people who believe that it's okay to, to abort a baby, to kill a baby within the womb. And here the Bible says, no, no, from the very conception, you knew what I was made. I was in a hospital room recently with a little baby, just a pound and a half or so. Just a little thing born prematurely, and the baby is now with Jesus. But you look at that little baby, so small, so little, and yet all his fingers are there. His eyes, his eyebrows, his head, just ears are completely formed. All the beautiful things that, that God makes in a child. And the Bible says here that we're fearfully made. Listen, let me just say to you, uh, have faith in how God made you. Doesn't mean you brag about it and say, oh, I'm just the best thing since ice cream. Look in the mirror and say, man, you're all that. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying don't buy into thinking you're no good. You're not as comparing yourselves among yourselves, which is not wise. I'm amazed how many times children... There's so much inside of us. We don't want to wear something to school that may not be fit because we don't want friends to make fun of us. I think about one little boy who came down here a few weeks ago and he just bawling. And he wanted to get, he had already been saved, but he didn't tell anybody he'd been saved because he knew he needed to get baptized. He didn't want his friends to make fun of him. He didn't know what his friends were going to say. But boy, we have confidence in how God made us. He made us. Go ahead and let's see what the Bible says about further about that and we'll need to hasten. Verse 15, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, when I was conceived and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance and yet being imperfect or not mature yet, in thy book all my members were written, which is in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. He said, even a child, and that's one thing we talk about, the book of life. Your members are in the book of life. That Whenever someone's conceived, their name is in the book of life. I guess it's the only positive thing I can see about killing the unborn. Is at least their name is God. Maybe they're forgotten by God. And they're not a problem for society. And, and they won't pop, overpopulate and eat our food. And, and they won't complicate the system. All that's junk, obviously. But I tell you, someone who doesn't forget them, and that's God. He said, I know exactly when you were formed, and I know your members, and I've recorded all that stuff in my book. And then, of course, the psalmist is getting excited. He says, hey, he knows me. He's with me. He made me. And then look at the next thought real quickly in verse number 17. Read it with me, can you? How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. How great is the sum of them. It's kind of like the other, the other verse when he said, it's too wonderful, it blows my mind. And they said, you know what, how wonderful are your thoughts that you have tracked me when I was conceived all the way through my life. You know exactly what I'm like and you still love me anyway. How precious, how wonderful are the thoughts you have to me. If we can number, they're more than can be numbered. Miss Zeta Torres, one of our precious ladies, put this to song, and I love the song. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they are more than can be numbered. So God tells us here that he loves us. Of all the things God thought about today and has to think about, weather patterns, feeding everybody on the planet, taking care of the ecological systems and things of that nature. You know what else he thought about today? He thought about you. He thought about your family and your heart and your needs and your hurts. He thought about you. How precious also are his thoughts among us. He loves you. He not only knows us and he's with us and he made us, but he loves us. You know, when you think about someone with pleasant thoughts like that, it's because you love them. That's why I thank God that he wrote down. You know, what a letter means to someone, it means you're thinking about them when you weren't with them. And you know, God loved us so much that he wrote it down for us. He was thinking about us thousands of years ago when he wrote the scriptures. So that you would ever wonder, if you ever forgot he loved you, read in the Bible, he loves you. 
Our time is just about up. The next few verses talk about that he protects us. He protects us. How many would say, man, I know when I almost bit it, I almost died, and God miraculously spared my life. Anyone have a story like that? I do. I have more than one. I think I'm like a cat. I got nine lives. Lots of little close calls. I think, oh, my goodness, if I had just been a hair's breadth, I was getting ready to meet my maker. But you know, God's protecting me. There's been some times I've been overwhelmed by fear, and I just know for sure if I was going to make it through that day, and yet God swept down and just helped me. He protects us. That's the kind of God we have. And by the way, he's not stressed out by anything. He's not overwhelmed by anything. He protects us. He loves us. He knows us. He's with us. He made us, and he protects us. But I want you to know the last thought. Verse number 24 and 25, or t- excuse me, 23 and 24. Let's read it together, can we? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Here he says he forgives us. You know, he, the psalmist, after knowing that God knows him, he's with him, he made him, he loves him, he protects him, he said, okay, then you can have access to my heart. You can search me and see if there be anything inside of me that you don't like. And if you find something you don't like, you tell me, and I want to change it to lead me into an everlasting perspective. Dear friend, that's good for people who are saved. Because if you don't trust God and you don't understand God, you won't give him access to your heart. You won't give him permission to do what, you want to, what he wants you to do. You won't trust him with your marriage. You won't trust him with your kids. You won't trust him with your finances. You won't trust him to forgive somebody who's hurt you. No. Nope. Your understanding, my understanding of God allows me to say now at the end of the chapter, he says, okay, now, Lord, I'm going to open my entire heart's house to you. You can open every bedroom. You can open every closet. Search me, oh God, and know my heart and see if there be any wicked way. If you see something wrong in me, because I trust you now. You know me. You're with me. You'll never leave me. You made me. You, You love me. How you think about me. You'll protect me. Then now... Lord, I trust you. You can search my heart and lead me into everlasting way. May I say there's another person I want to just speak to you about. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. I was just like that on a service like this one on a Sunday night in a section on this side of the auditorium and not in this building, but one like it, a lot smaller. But someone asked me in that, set, in that service, do you know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven? I didn't know that. But that became the very best question and it led me to the very best day of my life when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. If you're like that today, may I tell you, you can trust God. You can't trust people. You can't even trust yourself. But you can trust the Lord. He loves you and He can give you not only eternal life, but He can give you help for everyday life. And He's worthy for you to open your heart and allow Him to come in. He'll save you. Let's pray together, can we?